For The Real News, I'm Lynn Fries in Geneva. 2017 was a record year for international patent filings at the World Intellectual Property Organization. Country rankings as origin or source of those applications is a closely watched statistic, with a question being who filed the most applications. Results showed China moved into second position as a source of international patent applications filed via WIPO in 2017, closing in on longtime leader the United States. Among the top 15 performing countries, only China posted double-digit growth in 2017. And since 2003, China's growth rates of international patent applications have exceeded 10% every year. So what do these statistics on China tell us? The World Intellectual Property Organization runs three international filing systems used by all major corporations of the world, most notably multinational corporations racing to expand vast intellectual property portfolios. WIPO's press conference on 2017 results made clear that it's the system for patents that gets the most attention. That's because it's technology and a very good indicator of the relative strengths in the fields of technology of the various countries of the world. So explained WIPO's Director General, Francis Gurry. Here's a clip from that press conference. I mean, the articulated expressed strategy of the Chinese leadership is to go from made in China to created in China. So if you like, in you know, very simplistic terms, to go from being the factory of the world to the laboratory of the world. What we have seen is, I think, an extremely strategic approach adopted by China, uh, which is coming from the top of the leadership of China, an emphasis on innovation by President Xi Jinping, uh, and by Prime Minister Li Keqiang and the rest of the state leadership, uh, and a number of careful policies put in place in order to develop techno the technological capacity of China, covering fields such as artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing, uh, and so on. So this, I think, is the reality of what we've seen in the course of the last 20 years. And the reality is that a new competitor has arrived. Uh, and, uh, and it's a very strong competitor, as the figures would show. Joining us to discuss this and related issues is Peter Drahos. We last spoke with Professor Drahos from his office at the Australian National University. Today, Peter Drahos joins us from Italy, where he's a professor of law and governance at the European University Institute. Welcome, Peter. Hello, Lynn. You're an eminent figure in the world of intellectual property, so I wanted to get your take on these IP stats. What do you think? Do you think they are a good indicator that China has arrived as a major technological competitor? Look, I think that's the right reading of the statistics. Um, of course, patent statistics are only one measure of innovation, but they, they do show uh, that China is placing a huge emphasis on developing in certain areas, in the electricity area, in the digital uh, communications area, in the computer area, uh, along uh, with chemicals um, and at the same time they're trying to get the, the commercial benefits uh, of the, this drive to develop as a, as a scientific power um, and it's been uh, a story of remarkable progress uh, if we think uh, back to the fact that China really only began to shift uh, towards a market economy um, in the early 1980s. So in your view, China has learned to play the IP game. Yes, that's, that's exactly correct. It's become very adept. It's a fast learner. We see this in monumental uh, patent filings. I mean, applications now are well over a million. Uh, we see astonishing trademark numbers. The US has accused China of intellectual property theft. Comment on that in the 
broader context of this shift by China to a market economy? The problem for China is that uh, it has been a factory for the world, but this has come uh, at a great environmental cost. So it wants a different kind of economy, uh, an economy in which it captures more value uh, from the things that it makes, but it would also like to make things that are less, uh, less polluting, uh, so-called knowledge economy things, uh, more software, more uh, high technology products. Um, so uh, the desire of all countries to capture more wealth at lower environmental cost um, is, is a goal that they all share. Now, um, US accusations against uh, China when it comes to uh, intellectual property uh, infringement, of course, have some basis in fact. Uh, any country that seeks to uh, improve its uh, innovation system will look at innovation leaders, and the United States is undoubtedly uh, an innovation leader. And so um, China looks at uh, what uh, US science does, what US companies does, and it seeks to learn from that. But at the same time, China has also made great strides in improving its own intellectual property system. I think we should give China a lot of credit for um, first of all, enacting intellectual property standards that in many ways were pushed upon it um, before it would have liked to have adopted those standards. Uh, I mean, China as a, as a poor country was not really ready to embrace uh, intellectual property at the point uh, that the US was insisting uh, that it do so. But China basically complied with US demands. It, it enacted standards that are compliant with the World Trade Organization Agreement, the TRIPS-related agreement on intellectual property rights. Uh, and so, uh, as I said, I think some uh, credit should be given to China for having enacted those standards and for trying to get better compliance. And of course, if you want to build an economy uh, on the basis of innovation, uh, then to some extent you have to have uh, an intellectual property system uh, that, that people uh, use and, and play by its rules. Um, otherwise, you really uh, won't get uh, or won't capture those value chains that, that bring you wealth. What are your thoughts on the U.S. tariffs imposed against China by the Trump administration and China's retaliatory tariffs and claim uh, filed against the United States of the WTO? Yes, look, I think most observers would say um, that this is a lose-lose game, really. I mean, the United States, if we think about this historically, uh, had the most leverage over China when China was, first of all, seeking access to the US market as an exporter, and so it wanted uh, the United States to grant it most favoured nation status. So obviously that gave the United States a great deal of bargaining power. And secondly, uh, the United States had a lot of leverage over China because China wanted to become a member of the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, or what then became uh, or evolved into the World Trade Organisation. So those two things. Uh, most favoured nation and membership of the World Trade Organization gave the United States a great deal of bargaining power. But actually, even in the early 1990s, when the United States really began to threaten uh, China with trade uh, retaliation, um, the, the Chinese responded uh, with some counter retaliation. I mean, they began to list certain uh, goods that uh, US companies were exporting into China. And ultimately, in the early 1990s, what we saw was that the United States and China reached an accommodation. They came up with some memoranda of understanding. Everyone more or less said they had uh, got a good deal. Uh, and that was that. Uh, now, I would be very surprised if something similar here didn't happen, given the fact 
that China now is the world's second biggest economy. Uh, at some point, it's going to chug past the United States and become the world's biggest economy. And the idea that uh, uh, China will roll over or kowtow to the United States on something so public and that is so central to its own image of itself, I think is very, very implausible. Which implies that although trade threats may have been effective for the US in the past, those days are gone. Look, I think that's certainly right. Um, the United States simply cannot push China in the way that it was able to in the 1980s in particular uh, and in the 1990s. Its relative power over China has declined. Uh, and if you have a look at the import and export relationships between uh, China and the United States, as well as the broader uh, global agendas, whether one is talking about uh, climate change or, or world security, um, their interests are so intertwined that an all-out trade war um, that would ruin relationships with them seems a, a terrible option. And I think many interest groups in the United States would not support um, such, uh, such a blitzkrieg approach to uh, handling China. I think many interest groups in the United States, um, particularly is, uh, if this was to escalate, would ultimately uh, lobby the United States trade representative, would, would lobby the president and would really ask for common sense to prevail because there are just too many interests that would be adversely affected by a deep and scarring trade war. What if rather than a lose-lose trade war, common sense were to prevail? What would it look like? Well, I think um, probably uh, China would agree to do a bit more on uh, compliance with intellectual property standards. Uh, the United States uh, would offer some more capacity building. I mean, already there are lots of initiatives between the United States uh, and China when it comes to capacity building in intellectual property. Many US experts travel to China and offer their views and offer assistance. There's close cooperation between uh, the Chinese Patent Office and the United States uh, Patent Office. So I think at a technical level, at a technocratic level, we see lots of cooperation and uh, eventually, uh, once the dust settles uh, and you know people stop uh, threatening billions of dollars of tariffs, uh, what we would probably see is some sort of agreement to do uh, more in the intellectual property area. Um, China might well uh, offer a little bit more on market access, a little bit more uh, transparency. Uh, it's that sort of thing, I think, that we would see if, if common sense were to prevail. What I hear from what you're saying is the world's two biggest economies need to cooperate rather than wasting time and resources in a lose-lose trade war. Well, absolutely. I think the trade war will get us nowhere. I mean, I think all that will happen will be that we'll see uh, markets frightened, um, we'll see uh, a, a lot of um, a lot of uh, side, a lot of interest groups lose on both sides. I mean, U.S. farmers will obviously be affected, and ultimately, U.S. high technology companies um, that assemble goods uh, in China will also end up losing. Obviously. Uh, Chinese companies that are seeking to export into the US market will lose. So there'll be a bunch of losers, a very long list of losers. Um, so that, no one's going to win from this. I think the more important issues though are the issues that we see um, being, uh, that we're alerted to by scientists. I mean, we are in a serious uh, ecological and climate situation. We've had warnings now for decades um, of degenerating ecosystems. Um, all around the world, uh, we're seeing uh, climate-related problems, uh, declining uh, outputs 
agricultural outputs in some countries, for example, in South Asia because of uh, problems with the monsoon, of uh, problems with heat and so on. And so what we really need are the world's two biggest scientific powers, and I would say that by now China is probably the world's second largest scientific power. We really need cooperation on what are major uh, global problems and will become major global uh, catastrophes. So the last thing we want is a trade war, and more imperatively, we want countries cooperating on science, we want countries sharing knowledge about how to address problems, whether they're health problems, pandemics, epidemics, or whether they're climate uh, problems, whether they're ecological catastrophes, the consequences of drought. There's a long list of things that we need to talk about uh, as a global collective, um, and that's what China and the United States really need to be talking about. And under the current IP regime, is, is that uh, plausible? Well, that's a good question. My own view is that China's embrace of intellectual property rights is to some extent a mistake because it, it creates almost uh, an arms mentality, a, a kind of arms race in which the game mainly is getting scientists to apply for as many patent applications as you possibly can. And if you think about it for a moment, the uh, intellectual property-based innovation system that we had is really a failure. I mean, um, think about the price of medical drugs, for example, the price of pharmaceuticals. I mean, we now have pharmaceuticals in the United States, cancer treatments that are approaching half a million dollars. I mean, that's unsustainable for American citizens, and it's certainly unsustainable for poor people, and it's unsustainable for Chinese citizens. Likewise, think of the price of textbooks, or think of the fact that so much knowledge is hidden behind copyright paywalls, and the way in which publishing cartels block citizens from getting access to knowledge that their tax dollars have, have paid for, so it, it, it's really an absurd system. It's an irrational system. So the idea that, that China is embracing this system, a system that in a sense the United States imposed on it, I think is, is, a, is a grave error. And we're all going to suffer for it. What I mean is that global citizens everywhere are going to pay uh, the consequences of this. You know, we need knowledge that's produced with public tax dollars to be freely available. You know, you and I should be able to uh, get the knowledge that we want by, by uh, visiting a website and downloading what we want. We shouldn't have to pay 30 or $40 for a scientific article if we're interested in that scientific article. That's simply absurd. We shouldn't have to worry about cancer treatments that are going to cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars that may send us into bankruptcy. And that's the kind of thing that the patent system has delivered for us. So I think both countries need to rethink this agenda. And certainly if China cares about equality, it cares about um, inequality, about doing something about inequality, it should be addressing these issues and it should be showing more leadership on these issues. What about the careful planning and extremely strategic approach on the part of Chinese leadership uh, in achieving their goals uh, in the top fields of technology. We heard a WIPO press conference in the words of Francis Gurry. The plan is to, for China to go from being factory of the world to laboratory of the world. China is already gene editing human. And with an online population greater than the entire population of the United States, it's making rapid advances in artificial intelligence. We see the former top deputy uh, helping lead artificial intelligence strategy at Microsoft uh, is now in Beijing at Baidu, a premier AI uh, company in China. The conventional wisdom being to train the algorithms that will deliver intelligence, you need data. And the company with the most data wins. Give us some perspective on all this. The United States should be thinking about 
the longer term picture here. It is undoubtedly true that a country that has access to hundreds of millions of citizens can in effect conduct the largest scale experiments in scientific history. So if we think of the Chinese population, uh, all those that are on the internet as an experimental population. So let's say that that's roughly a billion people. Then essentially that a uh, source of big data will allow uh, Chinese scientists to develop learning algorithms at a rate and at a scale that is historically unprecedented. Now, the problem is this, that when you run scientific experiments at a university, you need clearance from a university ethics committee. I mean, that's fundamental. That's, that's a fundamental uh, prerequisite, informed consent. But actually what we see happening in the world is that many experiments are taking place on citizens without their informed consent. And actually what we're also seeing is really uh, manipulation uh, of citizens' preferences uh, using big data and using highly forensically targeted algorithms. Now, as I say, China has a comparative advantage in the sense that it has a very large population upon which to experiment. Now, my own view is that this is ethically highly questionable um, and there are many issues um, about um, whether we as citizens uh, want to be experimented upon. Now, of course, you know, whether the Chinese government uh, will be consulting its citizens, whether the Chinese government will be protecting the interests of Chinese uh, citizens when it comes to this kind of experimentation is an open question. Um, but I, again, think we need uh, some leadership uh, on these issues. I think we need uh, a discussion of what sort of collective approach we would like. Uh, and I think citizens everywhere would like uh, some more discussion of this. I don't think it's, it's in the long-term interests of the United States um, to uh, enter a sort of arms race in this area um, because I think that's going to produce a frightening kind of dystopian world. Uh, we have a lot of choices about the future that we can create um, and unfortunately uh, I think intellectual property, the privatisation of science, an arms race mentality when it comes to the use of science is going to produce the sort of sci-fi future uh, that none of us really want, a kind of dark dystopian one. We could have a, a very different one, of course. The Obama administration, in promoting the Trans-Pacific Partnership, argued that it was of strategic importance for the U.S. to join the TPP to contain China. Now that the Trump administration may well do a U-turn in that direction, what's your assessment of the merits of that argument? China has many options here. It doesn't really have to uh, worry about the TPP all that much. I mean, it's launched its own Belt and Road Initiative, uh, an initiative that's looking at uh, integrating the economies of you know, 50 or 60 countries, uh, looking at the way in which um, city economies in China can be integrated with the city economies of Central Asia and ultimately Europe. I mean, this is a big and bold vision, uh, one that doesn't rely on trade agreements. So I do think that engendering some sort of um, competitive uh, arms race mentality is a mistake, I think. One should be reaching out to China, uh, seeking to uh, cooperate uh, on issues like the future of big data and uh, AI and thinking about the kinds of ethical guidelines that we need in this area, the kinds of protocols that we need in this area that would safeguard citizens' interests. I mean, I think it's very important that scientists in China, that scientists in the United States and scientists... Uh, in Europe as well as uh, citizens groups and so on, all become part of this large conversation about where we want to take these technologies. Uh, turning this into just trade talk and uh, competition uh, 
um, is a mistake. And I also think that if the United States thinks that it's going to somehow discipline China with these, with this kind of talk and these kinds of tactics, it's, it's really a mistaken uh, view of the world. To wrap up in a closing comment, talk about the concentration of ownership of intellectual property rights in the hands of so few multinational corporations, whether they're U.S. or Chinese corporations, and what that means for inequality, not only between countries, but within countries. Well, this is a complex economic question, of course, I mean, the re relationship between intellectual property and inequality, and it's, it's really an area that's been underexplored. But in a nutshell, let me say this. Intellectual property is a winner-take-all system. So if you have the patents over the latest artificial intelligence technologies or you own key trademarks, you basically are in a position to license or to control the development of a particular of a particular technology and capture all the wealth from that technology. So what that essentially means is that the winner takes all and you get a long tail of people who uh, are excluded. If you want competition, if you want competitive markets, you would reduce the role of intellectual property because essentially what that means is then that lots of players come in and you get marginal cost pricing. So my own view is that intellectual property fundamentally contributes to inequality. And that's both within countries because large corporations amass huge amounts of wealth over which I might add, they pay virtually no taxes, as has become clear in the United States, in Europe, and in Australia, and many other countries. They, am they amass large patent portfolios that bring them large amounts of wealth, this wealth being held in tax havens, and which do very little for equality, right? Essentially, they're in a position to uh, buy out their competitors, making uh, competition in the marketplace very difficult. So what we're going to see ultimately, uh, I think, are rising uh, Gini coefficients, rising um, inequality. So I think we need to have a conversation about the relationship between intellectual property and inequality. And the way you see it, this is related to issues of representation, democracy. Well, of course, I mean, um, if you create large concentrations of wealth, I mean, it's standard interest group theory, you create extraordinarily powerful lobbies. Um, so in authoritarian states, uh, these uh, large lobbies become uh, part of the elite. Uh, in democracies, you, in a way, um, uh, create uh, interest groups that uh, make uh, the workings of democracy very difficult because it's these interest groups that can uh, essentially afford campaign contributions uh, that control the media in various ways or influence the media. So uh, high levels of inequality uh, you know, are a fundamental problem for a democracy. There's very little doubt or disagreement about that. We have to leave it there. Peter Drahos, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.